imagine mining precious metals in space? Astroforge is on a mission to make that a reality, with demand for mineral resources skyrocketing due to the clean energy transition. There's increasing interest in sourcing metals from untapped places like the ocean and now outer space. The California-based company plans to launch a small refinery into space to extract valuable metals from M-type asteroids. Well, a pleasure to introduce Matt Garlich, uh, co-founder of Astroforge. Matt, thanks very much indeed for talking to us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So Astroforge, barely three years old. Presumably these ideas were born way before that. I'm sure you must have heard it all, right? It's too expensive. It's a fantasy. Why is securing resources from space the way to go for you? Yeah, look, when we look at, we're very focused on a group of metals called the platinum group metals, right? Pretty common thing that people have known about for a long time. And mining on Earth has some major problems with them. As you know, we've depleted a lot of the ore bodies we have on Earth that are easily accessible. Most of the platinum group metals now are really deep underground, and you're seeing these at about two kilometers and below depth. That's not easy to access, right? Ask any mining company how hard it is to get that deep in the earth and extract these materials at these extremely low grades. It's not a very cost-effective way to go do this. Um, and that's what we're up against. So when we talk about hedging that with space, well, we know where these minerals exist in space. They exist on a very specific type of asteroid called a metallic asteroid. They have extremely high concentrations of the platinum group metals. In fact, if we go look at some of the theories about how our planet formed and how the universe formed, we think that most of the platinum group metal deposits on Earth are formed from asteroid impacts. So the way I like to think about it is we're just going back to where they came from, right? Going to a much cleaner, much easier to access ore body in space. And with all the changes we've seen in the space industry, really what SpaceX has done uh, by making launch a lot cheaper, a lot more viable, a lot, a lot higher frequency, it's kind of led to this plethora of effects that allow us to now take a stab at going and mining asteroids for a fraction of the cost that it was ever possible for before and bringing back the material at a price that makes sense on a business scale. I think that's the big difference here. This is a business that we are running to be a mining company, and we think we can do it at much better margins than mining companies can on Earth today. It's interesting you mentioned viability there, uh, Matt. You've had other companies trying to do this before, two others, if I'm not mistaken, and they failed to land on any asteroids. What makes your attempts any different? Yeah, I mean, look, the companies you're referring to are companies called Planetary Resources and Deep Space Industries. These were great companies that were formed, but like anything, I think the timing was too early, right? It, you know, the, the best analogy I can use here is if you wanted to go to deep space in 2010, which is when both those companies were really in full swing, you kind of had two options. You could launch on a Delta IV or an Atlas V. Both of those rockets would cost about $450 million launch. That's really expensive to get out and do. Um, you know, for us, that's not the case anymore. We now have ride, you know, Falcon 9s going to the moon about once every six months. We can hitch rides on them. That's what we're doing with Intuitive Machines and their second launch. And because of that, we now have these high energy rocket launches that we can piggyback off of to get to deep space at a fraction of that cost. Just to give you a sense here, the all in cost for our mission that we're launching in a couple months here to go out to an asteroid is just under 7 million bucks. Like that is a revolution in the price point that you can access deep space at. And I hope that not only will that lead to things like asteroid mining and us being a viable mining company as we go forward, but I also think it opens the door to science, right? It opens the door to how we explore the universe at a totally different price point than anybody's ever thought of before. That's an incredible evolution on the, on the price. I want to talk about something else that happened, I think, a couple of weeks ago, if not just, uh, just last week. You've secured a U.S. Federal Communication Commission's first ever commercial license to operate in deep space. What is that? And, and, and what does this license mean for your exploration journey? What would it allow you to do essentially? Yeah, what it means on the, on the very base level is the FCC has approved us to go send data back from deep space, right? We have to communicate back with Earth. There's no reason to send a space probe out if you can't talk to it, right? And we need to send RF signals back to Earth at a very specific frequency to get data from it. But what it also means is that we've now gone through checking with NASA, with the State Department, with the FCC on what we're doing as a mission, how we're sending it out. We've gone through all the paperwork. We've kind of secured all the regulatory aspects of sending a commercial deep space mission. And now we get to be on the edge of history, right? Like this is the first commercial, fully commercial mission that will be sent to deep space. Mm -hmm. And um, that's going to be a huge kind of a, a huge undertaking. And I think a, a huge mark on human history as we continue to explore the universe. So I want, to, I want to get my hands or my head around this. Yeah, I'm bringing up the Odin spacecraft, if I've got that uh, 
pronunciation correct to the untrained eye, Matt. I mean, it looks like a dismantled television set. What exactly is this and how does it fit into your mission? I, I believe it's connected to the launch in January. Yeah, so I mean, Odin is the spacecraft, right? And when we talk about this, when we talk about essentially the way to think about it, is this is the spaceship that will take us out to the asteroid. Now, the objective of Odin or our second mission is to go out and take really high resolution images of these metallic asteroids that we believe we have found, right? We need to prove that the asteroid we have located is a metallic core asteroid, um, that it is near Earth and that we can access it. And that's the whole guys of this mission. So if you notice on those, I don't know what picture you're looking at, but there's two big cameras on that vehicle. The rest of it is all just spacecraft support. Most of what you're looking at actually is fuel tanks. Um, they're in a big silver bag in the middle of the spacecraft. And those fuel tanks are what give us all of the propellant we need to reach the asteroid and do the flyby of it. The rest of the equipment on there is just things to communicate back to Earth, to control the spacecraft. It really is in terms of the way we have built this. I mean, the way we look at this is this is the Ferrari of spacecraft. It is all fuel, it's all power. It has a very, very small payload. And it's really meant for one purpose go about 10 million miles away from Earth and take beautiful pictures of a metallic asteroid. Which brings me to my next question. I mean, so where about are these asteroids relative to Earth? I mean, presumably, you know where you're going, right? And, and the asteroid that you're targeting. Yeah, they're all in heliocentric orbit. So what that means is they're all orbiting the sun, um, very much like our Earth is. And they're going to be at different periods as we go around. And we do a lot of what's called trajectory planning here to make sure we can reach the asteroids on a specific cadence that we want to go out and mine them that they're viable targets, right? There's a whole laundry list of, of criteria we have for each one of these asteroids we go after. Um, we have a big board in the office. It's about 46 asteroids right now that we think are viable mining targets as we go out there. And we track them almost every single day. We commission a lot of telescope images for these things, right? We're always iterating down to say, how do we get the best data off of these asteroids? And how do we give us the highest chance to be successful at getting very lucrative ore bodies in space? Matt, at what point does this translate these extractions translate into an actual mining industry i mean is that far away from us i hope not i think the biggest benefit and, and the one thing that i just i feel like i just run around the company yelling at everybody every day is go faster like speed is our asset that we have to really make a change here and make this different i mean you've seen how fast we've built a spacecraft to go do this our launch cadence that we're going after and we're well on track to return the first amount of material which will be about a thousand kilograms of the platinum group metals way before the end of this decade. This isn't something that science future is gonna be in you know, 2050 before we're going. Like, we are launching pretty short order here to do the first mining mission to go attempt to bring this back. And I think from then what you're really asking is scale. You know, When do we start to make a dent in the actual overall platinum group metal markets? How do we think about that? Um, we have plans internal. Obviously we're not, we're not at liberty to discuss them right now. They're not something we'll publicly talk about, but mm. I hope the future for Astroforge and for the planet is that we can take one of the dirtiest processes we have on this on this planet, which is the mining of precious minerals, and bring it off world, right? Let's save our planet for what it's good at, which is supporting human life. And let's go tap the universe for what it's good at, which is raw materials. Well, Matt uh, Golich, the uh, co-founder of Astroforge, thanks very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you.